Boom! Shake the room, Fire Nation. JLD here, and welcome to Entrepreneurs on Fire, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network with great shows like I Digress. Today, we're pulling a timeless EO Fire classic episode from the archives, and we will be breaking down Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and Lady Gaga, uncovering how the world's most successful people launched their careers. To drop these value bombs, I have brought Alex Benayon. Alex is the author of The Third Door, which chronicles his five-year quest tracking down Bill Gates, Lady Gaga, Warren Buffett, Maya Angelou, Steven Spielberg, and dozens more of the world's most successful people to uncover how they broke through and launched their careers. And today, Fire Nation, we'll talk about the biggest mistake that people make when they look to interview people they admire, the dangers of over-persistence, and so much more when we get back from thanking our sponsors. Looking for a business coach who has helped thousands of entrepreneurs increase profitability by an average of 104% annually, all for less money than it would cost to hire one minimum wage employee, all on a month-to-month basis? Schedule your free consultation today with Clay Clark, a former SBA Entrepreneur of the Year at thrivetimeshow.com slash fire. The My First Million podcast features famous guests, discusses how companies made their first million, and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. One recent ep was all about how venture capitalists make money. Listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts. Alex, say what's up to Fire Nation and share something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. What's up, guys? This is Alex and... Not only have I won one game show to help fund the book, but to fund the book launch, I ended up winning a second game show. What? People are going to think I stacked these (laughs) interviews, Alex, because the last person I had on, um, he was talking about how he was on the Wheel of Fortune and actually bankrupted twice, so he didn't win. But now you're on game shows as well. Like This is weird. And I was on The Price is Right and won a car, so what's going on here? What game shows were you on? I was on, I'm the same as you, man. I was on The Price is Right. No way. What'd you win? With the prices right, I ended up winning a sailboat. <laughs> and with the second game show, I ended up winning a car. Wow. And I, and I sold both of them to help fund the book. But then you had to pay taxes on them too. <laughs> yeah. And that was brutal because I had to pay it and it was brutal. Well, listen, Fire Nation, we have a killer audio masterclass, as I promised. And the title of this obviously is going to draw you in because it's phenomenal. Bill Gates Warren Buffett and Lady Gaga uncovering how the world's most successful people launch their careers. This is going to be so awesome. Alex, I love this. So how did this whole journey of yours get started to where we're at today? It started about seven years ago. I was 18 years old, a freshman in college, and I was spending every day lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling. And to understand why I was doing that, you have to understand, you know, I'm the son of Jewish immigrants, which pretty much means, you know, I came out of the womb, my mom cradled me in her arms, and then she stamped MD on my ass and sent me on my way. (laughs) So, you know, you think it's funny, but in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween and thought I was cool. You know, that I was that kid. You know, I went to pre-med summer camp in high school, and by the time I got to college, I'm the pre-med of pre-meds, but really quickly, I remember, you know, looking over at the stack of biology books on my desk, feeling like they were dementors sucking the life Mm. out of me, and, you know, at first I assumed I was just being lazy, you know, I was hitting the snooze button, you know, four or five times each morning, but eventually I began to wonder maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path somebody placed me on and I'm just rolling down. Not only am I going through this, what do I want to do with my life crisis? The questions start evolving in my head of, you know, okay, not only do I not know what I want to do, but, you know, even if I did, how did all these people who I look up to, how did they do it? You know, how did Bill Gates, when he was this unknown 19-year-old in college, sell software out of his dorm room? Or how did Steven Spielberg, when he was rejected from film school, go on to become the youngest director in Hollywood history. These are the things they don't really teach you in school. So, you know, I just assumed there had to be this book out there. So I go to the library and I just start ripping through business books and biographies and self-help books. But eventually I'm left empty handed because there wasn't this one. I was looking for this one book that had, you know, all these people in it with all from all these different 
industries and backgrounds that was really focused on when they were, you know, just trying to launch their careers and break through when nobody knew the name, when nobody would take their calls, how they did it. So, you know, that's when my naive 18 year old thinking kicked in. And I thought, well, if no one's written the book I'm dreaming of reading, why not write it myself? You know, I thought it would take a couple months. I would just call up Bill Gates, <laughs> interview him, interview What's everyone up, else. Bill? Exactly. You know, you know, Bill helps, you know, kids all the time. I thought, you know, he was my generation Santa Claus. I thought that would be the easy part. The hard part I figured was getting the money to fund the journey. And, you know, we talked about this a little in the beginning. So two nights before my final exams during my freshman year of college, I'm in the library doing what everyone does in the library right before finals. I'm on Facebook <laughs> and, you know, I'm on Facebook and I'm looking and I see someone offering free tickets. So the price is right. What? And the first thought, you know, I, it still sounds crazy to me, but the first thought in my mind, you know, cause I was so obsessive about trying to figure out how this, you know, book journey would get funded. My first thought was, what if, what if I go on the show and win some money to fund this dream? You know, it wasn't my brightest moment. Plus I had, you know, I had a problem. I had finals in two days and I had never seen a full episode of the show before. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the show everybody watches when they're homesick from school in like right. fourth grade. So everyone's seen bits and pieces, but I'd never seen a full episode. But I figured like, you know, how hard could it be? But, you know, I told myself it was stupid. I had finals and I needed a focus. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been in one of these positions where a thought just keeps crawling back and back into your mind. So to prove to myself it was a bad idea, I remember taking out my spiral notebook. You know, I'm sitting at this round wooden table in the corner of the library and I take out my spiral notebook and I write down the best and worst case scenarios, you know, worst case scenarios, fail finals, you know, get kicked out of pre-med, lose financial aid. Mom stops talking to me. No mom kills me. Look fat on TV. You know, there's like 20 cons. The only pro was maybe win enough money to fund this dream. It almost felt as if somebody had tied a rope around my gut and was slowly pulling in a direction. And I decided that night to do the logical thing and pull an all-nighter to study. But I didn't study for finals. I studied how to hack the prices right. And I went on the show the next day and executed this ridiculous strategy. And I ended up winning the whole showcase showdown, winning a sailboat, selling the sailboat. And that's how I funded the book. Okay, well, real quick, though, like, how do you hack getting onto the show in the first place? Well, you probably know this, you know, better than anyone because you've been through a similar experience. The Price is Right has this way, and it's funny because it's not only The Price is Right, it's pretty much anything in life. They have this way of making it feel like it's completely random and luck. Mm -hmm. You know, they go, Alex, come on down, as if they pulled your name out of a hat. But, you know, as you know, there's a system to it. And there's a producer who interviews every single person every in the person. audience before the show begins. And, you know, some people know that. But what I found out at about 4 a.m. during my all-nighter, you know, I'm on the 23rd O of Google <laughs> at this point. And it was funny because I remember finding this. It wasn't even on a website. It was on one of those old, like, 1990s, like, web blogs in one of those comments, like a message board. And someone said that they had this theory that there was also an undercover producer who's planted in the audience who then confirm or denies the original producer's selection. <laughs> so when I got to this, you know, the next morning I get to the Price is Right studio and the second, you know, I step foot on that lot, I tell myself, I have no idea who this undercover producer is. So I just have to assume everyone's the undercover producer. <laughs> so, you know, I'm flirting with the security guards. I'm talking with the janitors. I'm break dancing and I don't know how to break dance. And, you know, eventually you get into line and the line curves through these metal railings and it's my turn to be interviewed by the casting producer. And the second I saw him, you know, I knew instantly he was my guy because I had spent hours researching everything I could about him. 
I knew his name was Stan. I knew where he grew up. I knew where he went to school. I pretty much knew what he ate for breakfast that morning. And I knew that he has a clipboard, but it's never in his hands. <laughs> it's in his assistant's hand who sits about 20 feet behind him. And Fire Nation, I can verify all this because I did the exact same thing. <laughs> like I went up there and for me, actually, it was a little bit of a different experience. I didn't hack. I was actually kind of clueless myself the whole time, but I just got lucky with the hack, meaning that it would happen to be Veterans Day. I am a veteran. And so when I was getting interviewed, I mentioned that, like, I'm just happy to be here. And the price is right on Veterans Day being a veteran. And so, of course, like, you know, that probably helped out because then when I got up on stage, finally, like, Drew was like, John, it says here that you're like a veteran. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a veteran. So, I mean, that kind of, they kind of worked with that, I'm sure. But it's just interesting how you found another way to hack this stuff. And then eventually <laughs> funding the project by winning and all this stuff. But you're going to have to read the book to find out more details about Fire Nation. That's just how it is. But believe me, it's a really cool, <laughs> fun story. But I want to j- jump into some real cool information about the entrepreneurs that you interviewed. Like, what is the one biggest factor that you found every single entrepreneur has in common? So when I had started out on this journey, it was never my goal to find, you know, that one key to entrepreneurial success. Because we've seen those business books or those TED Talks and we all just, you know, roll our eyes. But what ended up happening, I would say about, you know, four years into this seven-year journey was that after doing all these interviews, and I don't know if you're a big music fan, but to me, after all of these interviews, I started to realize there was almost this common melody to every single story. And what I realized is it doesn't matter if it's Bill Gates or if it's Maya Angelou. They could be completely different on the outside. At their core, they all treat life, business, the exact same way. And the analogy that came to me is that it's sort of like getting into a nightclub. There's always three ways in. There's the first door, the main entrance, where the line curves around the block, where 99% of people wait in line hoping to get in. You know, that's the first door. And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and celebrities slip through. And for some reason, school and society have this way of making us feel like there's only two ways in. You're either born into it or you wait your turn like everybody else. But what I learned is that there's always the third door. And it's the entrance where you have to jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen. There's always a way in. And it doesn't matter if that's how Gates sold his first piece of software or how Wozniak and Jobs started Apple or how Lady Gaga got her first record deal, they all took the third door. Fire Nation, where is your third door? Like, where's that third door? It exists in your life. You just have to find that third door. Know that it exists. Now, Alex, one question that I have for you is, how the heck did you get these interviews? I mean, list off again some of the people that you did interview and then tell us about the strategy behind getting these interviews. Because I'll say by far and away, the number one question that I get is, John, how'd you interview Tim Ferriss, you know, Tony Robbins, Barbara Corcoran, Gary Vaynerchuk, all in the first 90 days of launching your podcast? So spill the beans, brother. <laughs> I feel like you've been taking a lot of third doors too, man. <laughs> a lot. You know, the people who ended up being in the book and who I had originally set out to were people from, you know, all industries. So for business, I interviewed Bill Gates, for music, Lady Gaga, for science, Jane Goodall, computer science, Steve Wozniak, Maya Angelou, Larry King, Jessica Alba, Quincy Jones, Pitbull. It's been this really unbelievable journey. And the way each interview came to be was completely completely different in its own adventure in and of itself. You know, it took two years to get to Bill Gates. It took three years to get to Gaga. And, you know, with Warren Buffett, it was this whole eight month quest of writing letters back and forth with him and eventually hacking his shareholders meeting. But some of them were, you know, just crazier stories than others with Larry King. What ended up happening was I had just gone on that eight month adventure with Warren Buffett. And at the end, after the shareholders meeting, things sort of, you know, blew up in my face. It was almost this like beautiful train crash. (laughs) And I go back to LA and I'm really just down on myself. And thankfully I have just really wonderful friends who, when they see me, you know, moping around, they sort of like to, you know, pull me up and rally me. So one of my friends, Corwin, you know, convinces me to go get lunch with him. And so he can give me this pep talk. 
So we go get sandwiches from this grocery store and we're sitting on the sidewalk and I'm just, you know, doing what you do with your best friend. I'm just venting and I'm telling him, you know, all my troubles with this book and getting interviews. And he's like, come on, man, don't you have anything lined up? And I'm like, I got nothing. And he's like, come on, like you can't get so down on yourself. And I'm like, look, man, even if I did have an interview, I'd probably f- that up too. You know, I, I don't even know how to interview this, you know, this is like rocket science to me. And he's like, look, man, it's, it's not a science, it's an art. And, you know, as we're talking about this, one of the most miraculous moments of my whole life happens. A car pulls up right in front of us, parks in the loading zone. The door swings open and out walks Larry King. Oh, man. And you know what's funny is it was so out there that I just completely froze. And I don't know if you can relate, but sometimes in the most opportune moments are when I feel the most paralyzed. Oh, totally. So, you know, my throat tightens, my, you know, my mouth clenches shut and Larry King just walks right past me into the sliding doors of the grocery store and I don't say a word. And my friend Corwin, you know, jabs his elbow into me and he's like, dude, what the hell? Like, why didn't you say something? And I just, you know, what's funny about fear is that it's really good at making logical excuses. So I just gave all these logical excuses of why it was a good idea to not say anything. And he just is like, dude, you have to go say something. And I'm like, oh no, he's in the grocery store. He's probably, you know, far gone. He's like, dude, he's 80 years old. How far could he get? So, <laughs> you know, very reluctantly I stand up and I go into the grocery store to look for Larry King. And I'm looking around the bakery, you know, no Larry. I go to the produce section, you know, fruits, vegetables, no Larry. And right then I remember he had parked in the loading zone. So he must be leaving any second now. So this boost of adrenaline kicks in and I start sprinting through the grocery store going aisle after aisle after aisle. No Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry. You know, I speed down, cut a left. I'm running down the frozen food section. You know, I'm dodging old ladies. No Larry. So he, you know, he has to be at the checkout counter. So I go one, two, three, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry, no Larry. And at this point I want to kick myself because literally God put him right in front of me and I completely blew it. So I'm walking out of the grocery store in the parking lot and I'm looking down at my feet and I slowly lift my gaze and right there, you know, 30 feet in front of me is Larry King suspenders and all. And, you know, I don't know what happens, but there's just this rumbling in my stomach and I start yelling at the top of my lungs, Mr. King. And the echo in the parking lot just reverberates and everyone, you know, turns their heads around and, you know, poor Larry King, he's had quadruple bypass surgery. Right. He's 80 years old and I'll never forget his shoulders like jumped a, you know, a foot in the air and he slowly turns his head around his, every wrinkle on in his on his face is like sprung back and he looks like he's looking at the grim reaper <laughs> you know at this point i'm like too deep in the hole to pull back now so i just like run over to him i'm like mr king mr king my name's alex i'm you know i'm 19 years old i've always wanted to say hi and he goes okay hi <laughs> and he just walks away uh you know poor guy is holding his like his grocery store right. bags like now it's like getting speedy. warm, it's curdling. Yeah, the whole thing. Exactly. I actually remember there was like pirate booty in his grocery store. <laughs> Yummy. I love that. <laughs> so he's speeding towards his car and I'm just like, it's so awkward at this point. I don't know if I should like stop or continue following him. So I just continue following him to his car, trying to think of something to say. And eventually he like opens the trunk of his car, stuffs his groceries in, opens the driver's side door and I go, wait, Mr. King. Can I go to breakfast with you and he looks at me like i'm this lunatic but before he answers he looks out onto the sidewalk and there's about 10 people now crowded around watching for, and waiting for his answer <laughs> so <laughs> i guess he just you know felt bad and he just shrugged his shoulders and goes okay 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 and i'm like oh my god thank you what time and he looks at me and just slams his car door shut and I'm just, you know, shouting through the windshield, Mr. King, what time? And he looks at me and just starts his engine. 
I'm like, Mr. King, what time? And he looks at me and like puts it into drive. I'm now standing in front of his car, flailing my arms. Mr. King, what time? And he looks at me and just like mouths, nine o'clock and just speeds away. And the next morning I show up at his, his bagel shop that he owns in LA at nine o'clock. And there he is like sitting at the corner booth with his buddies. <laughs> and, you know, I had, I had a night to think over what happened and I was a bit embarrassed about how I acted the day before. So even though there was an empty seat at his breakfast table, I, you know, I didn't just plop down. I, I waved at him. I'm like, good morning, Mr. King. And he just looks at me and he's like, <laughs> like, you know, just mumbles and, you know, barely makes eye contact. So I assume he just needs a second to with his friends and he'll call me over. So I sit at the table next to him and, you know, 10 minutes pass, 30 minutes pass, an hour passes. And finally he stands up and he steps toward me. And I can like feel my cheeks lifting. <laughs> and then he walks right past me and heads for the exit. Oh. And I, you know, exactly. That's how I feel. So I just, you know, w put a hand in the air. I'm like, Mr. Mr. King. And he turns around and he's like, what is it, kid? What do you want? And I just, you know, I feel this really sharp, familiar pain in my chest. And I just look at him and I'm like, honestly, I just wanted some advice on how to interview people. And this slow smile spreads across his face, almost as if to say, why didn't you just say so? And he, you know, puts his hand on my shoulder and gives me one of the best monologues on interview advice. And then at the end, he looks at me and then looks up toward the sky, almost as if he's debating something in his mind. And then he makes eye contact with me again and just points and goes, all right, kid. Tomorrow, 8.45, see you here. And I show up the next morning. He's like, why do you even want to interview people? And I tell him about the book, and he's like, all right, I'm in. And over the course of the past five years, I've to breakfast with him about 50 times. Wow. And I mean, Fire Nation, that's the thing. When you get somebody like a Larry King, it's like the beginning of a snowball. Then everybody else says, well, if Larry King said yes, like, why wouldn't I? Like, you get that one key piece. Everything else kind of falls into place. And now, Alex, you did say that he gave you one of those best monologues ever. Now, don't go through the whole monologue. I doubt you could repeat it verbatim anyways, but what was that one key thing in that monologue that he gave you that you were just like, wow, that's a really good idea. That's a really good piece of advice. What's just one Larry King golden nugget? It was just so surreal because he's saying it and it's like his famous, you know, gravelly voice. And he's <laughs> like, he's like the, the, the biggest mistake, you know, he's, he's just like the biggest mistake young people make. And it doesn't really matter about their age. It's really about their stage. Anyone who's setting out to interview people, you know, whether it's for TV or a podcast or even interviewing someone for a job, the biggest mistake is that they look at the interviewers they admire, whether it's Oprah or Barbara Walters or himself, and they look at their styles and they try to copy that. Larry said that's the biggest mistake because you're focusing on what those styles are, not why those styles exist. Mm. You know, Oprah uses all this emotion. Um, Barbara Walters has these very strategically placed questions. And Larry asks, you know, the very simple questions people are dying to know. And what Larry said is that if you understand why those styles exist, that's the actual secret. And the reason those styles exist is because those are the styles that make those interviewers the most comfortable in their seats. And when you're comfortable in your seat, the interviewee is comfortable in their seat. And that's what makes for the best interview. Wow. Fire Nation, I mean, that is incredibly valuable. If you're going to be going down the path of interviewing people, you have to make that happen. You know, that's why I love starting these things off with a little bit of an icebreaker. I mean, you know, Alex said, hey, you know, I was on, you know, this game show and yada, yada. And then, you know, that's kind of like a funny little cool, quirky story that we get to tell and we get to maybe connect on as you know, interviewer, interviewee, and, and have a little more comfortable space. Like, this isn't just like this very serious conversation. So how can you make that person feel comfortable? Like, think about stuff like that. And if you think that Alex has been dropping value bombs, you're right. And guess what? 
we are going to be dropping value bombs when we get back from thanking our sponsor. The new year is here, and my guess is that you have big goals set for you and your sales team over the coming months. From new projects to bringing in more leads, a new year can often feel like a totally new start. But let's not forget the most important part, arming your team with the best tools so they can focus on giving your customers the best experience possible. And this starts with getting ahead of the learning curve so that new challenges turn into new ways to grow. With new features dedicated to helping your sales team improve your customer experience, HubSpot is on a mission to help millions of companies grow better Better, starting with yours. Conversion Intelligence Tools helps your teams get real-time insight into calls with automatic recording transcription and call analysis. With more visibility into customer conversions, coaching and customer feedback becomes that much easier. Plus, easy share meeting links let customers see availability and allow them to book meetings with you all from the HubSpot platform, which cuts out the endless cycle of scheduling emails. Learn more about how you can transform your customer experience with a HubSpot CRM platform at HubSpot.com. Looking for a business coach who has helped thousands of entrepreneurs increase profitability by an average of 104% annually, all for less money than it would cost to hire one minimum wage employee, all on a month-to-month -month basis? Fire Nation, meet Clay Clark. Clay has been coaching businesses since 2006, yep, even through the Great Recession, and he does it for less money than it would cost to hire a minimum wage employee. Inc. Magazine reports that by default, 96% of businesses will fail within 10 years, yet Clay's clients grow by an average of 104% annually. How's this even possible? Clay only takes on 160 clients, so he personally designs your business plan, plus Clay's team helps you execute that plan with access to graphic designers, Google certified search engine optimizers, web developers, ad managers, videographers, workflow mappers, and accounting coaches. Visit thrivetimeshow.com slash fire to watch thousands of testimonials from real entrepreneurs who Clay's helped over the years. Do your research and view thousands of documented success stories from real people like you thrivetimeshow.com slash fire. Then schedule your free consultation with Clay himself to see how he can help you with proven business coaching on a month-to-month -month commitment basis. thrivetimeshow.com slash fire. So Alex, we're back and you over these past years have learned a lot of stuff, but what would you say if you could just list out some of the most practical, tactical tools that you picked up from these entrepreneurs? Let's get specific, brother. So the most specific ones are the ones that, you know, changed my life the most. So everyone gave their own different things. With Tim Ferriss, he launched his career in a big way by cold emailing VIPs and CEOs so Tim Ferriss taught me his secret cold email template. With Bill Gates, what changed his career the most were his negotiating and sales secrets. So he taught me those. With Dean Kamen, one of the most important and profound in inventors on earth, he talked about you know the keys on innovation and when to keep going and when to stop. So everyone gave their own things. And you know I think one of the most valuable ones that anyone can use is what Tim Ferriss gave. So the context is that when Tim came right out of college, he actually got his dream job, not by, you know, submitting his resume somewhere, but he actually identified the company in Silicon Valley he wanted to work for the most, and he just sent email after email after email to the CEO. And then after that, when Tim wanted to become an author, he cold emailed other best-selling authors. And that was really one of the things that changed Tim's life. So I, I pre during my interview with him, I pressed him on, you know, what is, because I've sent cold emails and got a no response. So I'm like, what is like your secret template? And this is what he told me. So it goes like this, and anyone can use this. I've used it to reach out to people like Malcolm Gladwell. I have friends who've used it to reach out to Fareed Zakaria and um, Cheryl Sandberg, and everyone's gotten responses. And it goes like this, dear so-and-so. I know you're really busy and get a lot of emails, so this will only take 60 seconds to read. Boom, next paragraph. That's where you put you know, one or two sentences, max, of who you are and what credibility you have that's relevant to the person you're emailing. Again, one or two sentences, max. And the next paragraph, another two sentences, max, of your very specific question. Not, you know, what advice do you have for me? That would take an entire book for someone to answer, but something like what um, books have you read that have helped you the most with your sales process or what's the best, um, you know, podcast you listen to for inspiration, something that someone can answer to you in a sentence. And then 
the final paragraph is the clincher that actually makes all the difference. You go, I totally understand if you're too busy to respond. Ooh. <laughs> Even a one or two line reply will completely make my day. All the best, Tim. And that's just worked wonders. I wish I, you know, so could hype good. this more. It Because there's a couple things that make it really work. And the amazing thing about Tim Ferriss is he's very good at like breaking things down and explaining how it works. Yeah. You know, the opening paragraph, you're, the first half of the sentence saying, I know you're really busy and you get a lot of emails, immediately makes you stand out from everyone else because it shows that you're cognizant of the situation they're in and their time restraints. The second half of that sentence saying this will only take 60 seconds to read, it shows, first of all, that you're very thoughtful and it makes them a little curious to see if it actually will take 60 seconds to read. Because like, I know I'm busy, but... Uh... I guess 60 seconds, let's be honest. Right, and you're curious. And now, again, you can't say this will take 60 seconds to read and write 10 paragraphs. Right, it's going to be legit. You know, that's an autumn. Yeah, it's, you got to be honest. And then the final paragraph, you know, I know you're too busy to, res you know, if you're too busy to respond, again, it's actually the opposite of what almost everyone does. Everyone al always goes, you know, thanks in advance, looking forward to hearing from your response, something like that. Yeah, the thanks in advance, that's kind of, come on, that's lame. Right. Look, even if your mom said thanks in advance, you're like, mom, I'm, I'm busy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and, it, you know, and we love our mothers. So for a stranger to say that, it, it rubs them the wrong way. And look, I had been saying thanks in advance to everyone I had been called right. emailing before Tim gave me this advice. Because you're just assuming. You're assuming they're just going to answer by saying right. that if thanks you don't in know advance. the person, you need to come with them with your hat in hand. And what's funny about human psychology is that when you like let someone off the hook, they actually are so grateful for you being so thoughtful <laughs> and kind that it actually encourages them to reply more. It's counterintuitive, maybe. but it works. Okay, so let's go through this real quick. Number one, I know you're busy, yada, yada. Ne next thing is, this is only going to take 60 seconds. The next thing is, one or two sentences of, a re of relevant credibility, like it has, to, it has yep. to make sense in their world. One or two sentence question, very short, concise, to the point. And then you end with, I totally understand if you're too busy to respond. And then how do you finish that off? So it's, you know, I'm really busy. I totally understand if you're too busy to reply. Even a one or two line response will completely make my day. So you're pretty much telling them that if they take, you know, 30 seconds out of their life, they'll make your day. It's a pretty good ROI you're giving, you're giving them. Yeah. You're doing your good deed for the day. <laughs> yeah. You're, you're literally turning yourself into a charity case and you're telling them for 30 seconds of your time, you'll be helping out someone in need. And yeah. And, and if it's, if you have, if you really write a thoughtful email, people will be inclined to respond. So one thing that I also love that Tim Ferriss did and what he talks about is the silver medalist theory and the second place theory where he's like, listen, people that win, that come in first place or that are the best of the best, just look at the top of the top, you know, the gold medalist, you know, the person that's number one in X, Y, or Z, they get a massive disproportionate amount of the attention. But guess what? That second place person, that silver medalist, that number two, they might just be one one hundredth of a second worse than that individual. And in some ways, they might even you know be better. They just haven't caught all the breaks. And you go to that person who's getting a disproportionate amount less of attention, hat in hands, and you can have a great opportunity. Like Tim's talked about how he's like hired sil silver medalists to like train him in different things, you know, for essentially pennies on the dollar, just because their their demand's not there. <laughs> Where the gold medalist, you know, who won, you know, by maybe one one hundredth of a second is like getting all the money, all the attention, you know, and their time is so slammed. They have this, you know, mentality of I'm the best, I'm the best. So that's a lot of good stuff to think about. And for you, Alex, I mean, you made some big mistakes. And I want to talk about at least one or two of them. Like what were a couple of those massive mistakes you made? Part of this journey is an 18 year old trying to track down Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. So it's pretty much an entire story of <laughs> making mistakes. I only want the highlights, brother. The biggest... <laughs> Most embarrassing, flat on your face falling mistakes. You know, the biggest one that has the most important lesson for people to take into their own lives came from my mistake with Warren Buffett. So with Buffett, you know, I had thought that, you know, he talks about wanting to help kids and college students all the time. So I spent, you know, I made it my number one priority in life to interview Warren Buffett. 
So for six months straight, I did nothing else other than read books on Warren Buffett. Um, you know, listen to audiobooks, watch YouTube videos from 6 a.m. until midnight. Every day my whole life was Warren Buffett. And I would write these long, like two page, incredibly researched, handwritten letters. And I would send it to his office and he would actually handwrite responses back. Wow. But his responses would essentially say, like, thank you so much, Alex, but you know, I got a lot on my plate. But I just kept going because I thought, look, if he's handwriting a response back, then I'm 99% there. So I wrote letter after letter after letter after letter after letter, sending it to his house and to his office. I would call his assistant week after week after week after week every Wednesday morning for months. And, you know, by month five, it is getting excessive. <laughs> I flew, and then I flew out to Omaha. I sent flowers to the office. I met with people on his staff. I met his children, his grandchildren, his business associates. I kept reading in these business books that persistence is the key to success. So I just kept following that advice. I kept turning that key of persistence, assuming it would open the door. Now, what ended up happening is I eventually got the interview with Bill Gates. And the interview with Bill Gates went so well that Bill Gates' office was like, look, we really want to help you with this mission. How can we help? And I you know, told them about all the trouble I had getting to Warren Buffett. And they go, look, Warren is Bill's best friend. We can help with that. You know, If anyone can help with Warren Buffett, it had to be Bill Gates. So they you know, contact Buffett's office. And I'll never know exactly what happened. But essentially what I assumed the reply was, we know – all about Alex. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. And I got an email from Bill Gates' chief of staff saying, please, no more contact to Warren's office. Thanks. Whoa. <laughs> and, you know, it. I remember seeing that email and it feeling like someone had grabbed my gut and almost yanked it out of me. Because mm. what I realized is not only was the answer no, I had completely blacklisted myself from Warren Buffett's office. And what it showed me is that while all these other business books talk about persistence being the key to success, what no one talks about is the dangers of over persistence and how you can bang on a door so many times that people will call the police on you. And there's a huge difference between persistence, you know, banging on a door a few times, okay, that doesn't work, let me try the kitchen, let me try the window, let me make friends with the bouncer. Versus banging on the same door thousands of times to the point where people have to, you know, barricade themselves in. And I learned that I was so over persistent that I dug myself into such a deep hole that even Bill Gates couldn't pull me out. Fire Nation, when you find yourself in a hole that Warren Buffett can't pull you out of, um, that's a hole you do not want to be in. So that was definitely a massive <laughs> mistake, Alex. Thanks for sharing that. And it's just so clear that you know, you want to take these lessons that we're talking about to heart, but you got to apply common sense to everything that you hear, everything that you learn and everything that, you know, you're driving forward with. And so through all of this, Alex, I feel like you have really come to learn a lot in your journey and you understand a lot of the situation you're at today. What have you learned about defining success? Like, what would you say your definition of success is for you, Alex? For me, the entire definition of success changed when I interviewed Steve Wozniak. This is later on in my journey. It's after I interviewed Bill Gates. And, you know, I didn't even know that I had this pretty standard definition of success, which is, you know, the more, you know, accomplished you are, the more wealthy you are, the more successful you are. So that's, you know, pretty implicit Western definition. I didn't even know I had that. So I'm going to interview Steve Wozniak. I'm standing at this restaurant a couple blocks from Apple headquarters, this Chinese restaurant. And I'm a few minutes early and my phone rings and it's one of my best friends, Ryan. And I tell him I'm about to interview Waz and he goes, Waz? Seriously? And he's like, dude, Waz peaked like 20 years ago. Aww. He's not even, he, yeah, I know that's how I felt. But my friend Ryan just keeps on going. He's like, look, man, Waz isn't Steve Jobs. You know, look at Waz. He's not even on the Forbes list. But you know what? Maybe it's good you're interviewing him. Try to find out why he was never as successful as Steve Jobs. And before I could respond to my friend, 
I saw Wozniak walking towards me. So I, you know, I said bye to my friend, hung up, greeted Woz. We go into this restaurant and instantly, you know, we sit down, Woz starts ordering all the food, you know, we got chow mein <laughs> and we have beef and broccoli and we have orange chicken and we have egg rolls and we're just having the best time. And within minutes, it is undeniable that this is one of the happiest people I've ever met in my life. Oh, love it. And he's telling me about his wife and his dogs and his cars and his road trips. And he's laughing and he's telling me about how he met Steve Jobs, you know, actually just a couple miles from where we're sitting. And he's telling me how him and Steve Jobs actually bonded in the beginning, not over tech, but really over pranks. So Waz is telling me about all their funniest pranks and I'm just cracking up having – this is by far the most fun interview I've ever had. And about halfway through lunch, the words my friend Ryan told me before the interview began, you know, crept into my mind. So I started asking Waz some questions, trying to figure out what it was like when him and Steve Jobs were starting Apple to, so I could sort of see the difference between them. And Waz told me a handful of stories, but the ones that stood out are the ones that showed me how different their values are. So the first story takes place right before Apple was created. Steve Jobs was working at Atari and you know the boss at Atari tells Steve Jobs, look, go make this computer game and we'll pay you this amount of money. And Jobs knew that his buddy Steve Wozniak is way better at coding. So he goes to Woz and says, look, if you code this computer game, or it wasn't a computer, it was a video game. If you code this video game, I'll give you half of the $750 they're going to give me. Mm. And Waz goes, dude, that's super fair. Done. Deal. So Waz codes the game like in half the time, gives it a Jobs. Atari loves it. And Steve Jobs gives him half of $750. Decades later, randomly in the news, it's revealed that Steve Jobs was never paid $750 for that game. He was paid thousands and thousands of dollars. So that was the first story. The second story takes place very early on in Apple's history. You know, they started getting big and it was very obvious that Steve Jobs would be the CEO of the company, but it wasn't obvious where Steve Wozniak would be on the executive team. Would he be chief technology officer? What would he be? So Jobs asks him, what do you want to be? And Wozniak thinks about it and he goes, when I was a kid, I had decided that my definition of success is creating something with engineering with my hands that changes the world and having fun while doing it. And nothing about being on an executive team and managing other engineers does either of those things. Being part of corporate bureaucracy is the exact opposite of my definition of success. So Wozniak turned down the offer to be a chief executive at Apple and capped his position at engineer. And the final story he told me takes place a couple years later, right around the time of Apple's IPO. You know, Jobs and Woz were set to make more money than they ever imagined. And right around then, some of Apple's earliest employees go to Woz and tell him that Steve Jobs denied them stock options in the company. And Waz goes, that makes no sense. Let me talk to Steve. And he goes to Steve Jobs and tells him, look, these guys are family to us. They started the company with us. And Jobs essentially says, you know, 0% chance and slams the door. So Waz does the only thing he can. He gives some of his own stock options to those early employees. And on the day of the IPO, those early employees all became millionaires. And as I'm sitting at this Chinese restaurant and we're wrapping up lunch, I'm just looking at Steve Wozniak and he's laughing and smiling and he's cracking open this fortune cookie. And the words of my friend Ryan come back into my mind and the only thing I can think of is who's to say Steve Jobs was more successful? Wow, Fire Nation. I mean, when you're able to sit down and to ponder your life and your definition of success to these levels – you're really going to start getting that North Star. You're really going to start moving in that direction that's going to bring you to what I hope is your definition of success, which isn't just money, which isn't just fame, which isn't just fortune, but it's a combination of a lot of things that you know takes time to figure out. And I know that Alex is still going to have his definition of success evolve over the years as he moves forward, as his desires and wants and, and needs change as well. 
So the third door, as you can tell, is a book, Fire Nation, that's going to just tell you amazing stories, give you amazing life lessons. You know, as I've been saying the past few episodes, success leaves clues, Fire Nation. And what better way to actually find and follow the clues than of those that are incredibly successful to that next level um, than, you know, the people that we've been discussing today and so many others that are in this book. So check out The Third Door and Alex. Give us a very concise parting piece of guidance and then tell people how we can find out more about you and what you have going on. And then we're going to say goodbye. I love that. And thank you so much, man. This was a ton yeah, of Yeah, so much. I'll leave with one final piece of advice that really changed my life. When I look back at the seven-year journey, what I realize is that while I had set out to get you know all these amazing practical tools and lessons and tactics, those aren't the things that changed my life. And while the book is full of them and they've you know helped me tremendously, what changed my life is that this journey and this book changed what I believe is possible. And what I've learned is that you can give someone all the best wisdom and knowledge in the world and their life can still feel stuck. But if you change what someone believes is possible, they'll never be the same. You know, to answer your second question, the way people can find me is on social. It's really easy. All the accounts, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, it's all just at Alex Benayan. So B-A-N-A-Y-A-N. And the book website is super simple. It's thirddoorbook.com. So T-H- IRD thirddoorbook.com and it's also obviously available everywhere books are sold. Fire Nation, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with and guess who you've been hanging out with today? A, B, and JLD, but not to mention because of <laughs> who Alex has interviewed. You've been hanging out with Warren Buffett, Steve Wozniak, um, not Lady Gaga today, but you will when you read his book and some other amazing, amazing entrepreneurs. Larry King, obviously, the list goes on. Um, so keep up the heat, Fire Nation. And head over to EO Fire eofire.com. Type Alex in the search bar and his show notes page is going to pop up with everything that we've been talking about today. These are the best show notes in the biz. Timestamps, links galore, you name it, we got it for you. And of course, thirddoorbook.com. Check that out and then check Alex out all over the socials. And Alex, thank you, brother, for sharing your journey over this last these last seven years. You know, with Fire Nation for that, we salute you and we'll catch you on the flip side. Thank you, man. Hey, Fire Nation, hope you enjoyed our chat with Alex today, and I hope you're ready to master three unbelievably important skills. What are they? Productivity, discipline, focus, productivity, actually producing the right content, discipline, being a disciple to your plan of action, focus, following one course until success, and you can do this in 100 days, Fire Nation, with themasteryjournal.com and you will have my exact system that you need to ignite. Visit themasteryjournal.com. Use promo code podcast for a little discount and thank you for listening to the podcast and I'll catch you there, Fire Nation, or I'll catch you on the flip side. Looking for a business coach who has helped thousands of entrepreneurs increase profitability by an average of 104% annually, all for less money than it would cost to hire one minimum wage employee, all on a month-to-month basis? Schedule your free consultation today with Clay Clark, a former SBA Entrepreneur of the Year at thrivetimeshow.com slash fire. The My First Million podcast features famous guests, discusses how companies made their first million, and brainstorms new business ideas based on the hottest trends and opportunities in the marketplace. One recent ep was all about how venture capitalists make money. Listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.